Well, good morning. We're going to do Zechariah chapter 6 today. Um, since we've been talking about uh, New Zion a lot, and that's not even, well, it's New Jerusalem, but Zion is what it's called in the Old Testament, and that's what kind of trips people up a little bit. We're going to quick look at a video I, a guy channel that I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but I like his little timeline. I don't agree with everything of it, but I like that he includes the ultimate picture of, of Zion returning because it's all about, we've been talking about the garden being the temple, right? It's a picture of the temple and that's God's plan. I think all scholars will agree that the, the plan is to return to the garden, right? The whole earth is going to be, whether you think it's destroyed and built again, I think it's just going to be renewed. It's going to be healed. It's like the new covenant is a renewed covenant. It's not that he made his covenant with a different people. It's anyone could be adopted in to Israel or how we want to define Israel as Christians or the church. I think it's all AKAs for each other, right? We try to get tripped up on, well, it's a bloodline thing. Well, it's never a bloodline thing. It's not about being Jewish that saves you. It's about your faith. Because if anything, we learn from the Old Testament, if your bloodline and, and you're not obeying, you get punished or you get exiled or just God just, you know, not that he gives up on you, but it's like if you're not trying to be his bride, then, well, you go be part of the nations then. So uh, with this political arena, you need to kind of think about, well, where is America? What if we're just the nations, right? Because <clears throat> you can argue, and we talked about last time, Lady Justice and Lady Liberty. Not that they're goddesses, and Lady Liberty is really Ishtar, and oh my gosh, we're worshiping these things. It's not about that. It's about our law is perverted, you know, and I was watching Jim Staley the other day, it's the first time he's ever come on and really talked about why he went to prison and, and the corruption in the justice system, and maybe there's, he's just trying to spin it his direction, he did apologize and repent, and that was good to see, uh, but it was more about like seeing like, like knowing that he couldn't say what he wanted to say and defend himself because it would just make his sentence longer, because um, it is a corrupt system, and he, and and fighting it is really hard, and it's, it's, it's a battle, and it's a losing battle. Ultimately, we know it's a losing battle. Um, whether this nation started out a Christian nation, um, it's not going to end that way. And there's lots of Christians here, and we have a lot better than other nations for sure. But we need to keep that in mind, that who is our president? It's Jesus. Let's think about that. So hopefully you know, we agree on that and, and think about that. So that's what I think America is. It's it's part of the nations. It's not like we're Babylon either. I don't want to go that way. We're, we're part of these nations. We're probably part of that empire of Babylon. We're not the sole evil. Uh, but looking at the millennial reign, bringing us back to the garden, that relationship with God. And that kind of makes it real for me. It's like, what was Adam's original job? He's to eat and and take care of the land and, and be a gardener and, and, and build and have a family. And then we look at you know, Jesus when he returned, like that, maybe that was like a glorified body and type of state. Like he looked a little different. Uh, we still ate, he could walk through walls apparently. Um, different. So glorified body still kind of gives me the idea there's something physical. So this idea of dwelling in heaven, maybe not so much. So let's look at this little timeline and I'll pause it as we go. The 42 months leading up to the return of the Messiah, it's the two witnesses prophesying during 1260 days, that's 42 months. This is found in Revelation 11, 1 through 3. Simultaneously, it's also the 42 month reign of Apollyon. This is from Revelation 13, 1 through 10. So at the day of the Lord, the day that Yeshua returns, the first thing that happens is the last trumpet is blown and the first resurrection event happens. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 56. Also, a worldwide earthquake happens. And also, if you look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, it's going to talk about the resurrection. The first resurrection is not going to precede you know, the, the saints who survived the tribulation. So they're going to be resurrected first. I think he gets into that, maybe. That's Revelation 16, 17 through 20. The next thing that's going to be happening is the resurrected saints will be taken and escorted by angels 
to Zion above, to the New Jerusalem above. That's detailed for us in Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. Also, at the last trumpet that's happening at this at this day is signified the moment where Yeshua begins to descend and return with the angels. That's Revelation 11, 15 through 19. And during this moment, we see the sun and moon are darkened. That's Zephaniah 1, 15. And the battle of Armageddon is about to take place. And that's Zechariah 14, 1 through 15. And we'll actually get to that in Zechariah. I don't. I think there's two battles that we see. And I don't think he even gets into it because obviously, after this millennial reign. Uh, Satan is loose because he's bound for a thousand years so he comes back and there is some sort of battle at the end. Uh, growing up that's what I was always told was the Battle of Armageddon. Um, kind of researching more and more now that I'm looking at other viewpoints and that's kind of the goal is just look at different different timelines, different people's viewpoints. Uh, question the narrative you've been talk, told because um, could this be type of rapture? The resurrected saints are brought up essentially to heaven, right? They're brought to the place that has been prepared for them which is Zion or New Jerusalem, which will come down on earth. Um, I talk a lot about, most of my research been this year, is this Purim War. And I think it's kind of like, if you if you look at kind of the more of the narrative beyond Esther, there's this whole year or more where the Jews are very oppressed in Persia. So remember, Persia was 127 provinces from Egypt, covering the Middle East, not just you know the capital in Persia, but for a whole year, Jews were being murdered because this edict went out, knowing that you know, okay, if I kill this Jew, I get his property, I get you know maybe even his wife or anything like that he owns will be mine, unless he uh, converts. Um, well, not converts, but gives up his his Torah and his religion and and his God, and leading up to those three days, where which we call Purim, where they were allowed to defend themselves. We kind of forget about that whole year. So it might look like the tribulation, that time period up to then, is a time where we have to be persecuted. And then those last three days are kind of a picture of what's happening here, where there's salvation that's given to us. And I, I see that as a similar picture where it was, you know, us, Israel, Christians, and our neighbors kind of turning against us. Because that's what it's going to look like. Cause that's, and the Bible tells us, New Testament tells us that, you know, your your own brother and your neighbor will turn against you, your mother and father. Mother, mother and father. I can't speak this morning. Have some water. But let's let that play. The next thing that's going to happen after the Battle of Armageddon's over, angels clear the land, and there's seven days of de desolation. That's Joel 2, 1 through 11. It's also in Matthew 13. I think it's verse 49 through 51. Also, Leviathan and Behemoth are killed because they're going to be used for food for the survivors of the Day of the Lord. That's in Isaiah 27.1 and a whole bunch of other places. We've done other videos on our channel about Leviathan and Behemoth. That's something I want to check out. I've heard something like that before and, and reading some of the extra biblical texts. I think Baruch talks about it. Um, and then these Leviathan and Behemoth, kind of <laughs> he's got the picture of Godzilla there. And that's what, exactly what I think of it. It's like... Is this, uh, is this Clash of the, you know, whatever that movie was, uh, King of the Monsters? It, it's crazy to me. Uh, I'll have to look at this Isaiah or watch that video. So I have no thoughts on that, if you're wondering. It's, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, uh, I, I've heard about the two great monsters being created at creation. Um, some texts read a little differently in Genesis. It's just crazy to me that there's one on land and one on sea, and people talk about seeing the Loch Ness monster. I'm like, is that is that Leviathan? Curious enough, there was a, a patient that came to my office with the name of Leviathan the other day, which is just weird that you know, he's talking about this now. And that was just the other day. It's like interesting name. We called him Levi for short. So, anyways, I, I have no thoughts on that. If you're wondering, uh, a lot of this stuff, I'm just like, it's kind of what I have in mind similar different but definitely different than what i was raised with for sure the tim lahay and the left behind series i remember listening to him on cassette cassette tape and like well oh, rayford steel and oh and nikolai carpathia and wait all that stuff isn't really in the bible interesting the next thing that's going to be happening after that seven day period is the new jerusalem will descend and then judgment can begin on the wicked rulers this can be in Revelation 21 through 22, verse 5, two whole chapters. It's also in the book of Enoch, chapters 62 through 63. 
It's also it's in Matthew 25, 31. It's in a whole bunch of places. Also, the beast, the false prophet, and the ten kings are destroyed. Yeah, and it's come up a lot in Zechariah, where we've even read and that the the land will be kind of flattened to make way for this you know, structure to come down. In Revelation, we're given kind of big dimensions. I don't think in Zechariah it gives us dimensions. It kind of lets us know that there'll be sacrifices at that time for those thousand years, that the nations will come to this large structure, this giant golden cube that actually reminds me of the Holy of the Holies, or maybe like the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, because that's the idea is the garden will be the temple, right? So the whole earth will be the temple. This will be the Holy of Holies. So it's the same thing. It's all picture of the garden, just like maybe the tree of life was at the center before. You know, Jesus is our tree of life now. It all parallels to that. And if thing, things aren't paralleling and, and, ma and matching up in your mind with what you believe now, it's like God has, what is he, has he changed his plan? He's like, yeah, this garden idea didn't work out. He had this Israel idea didn't work out. So I'm going to try this other people and we're going to take them to heaven instead. I'm just going to stay up there. Uh, I don't see that in God's character. I gotta, you know, the whole, you know, instead of like mem mem memorizing scripture, think about everything in context or kingdom in context, the name of this channel, uh, scripture in context and understanding the heart of God and what his goal is will help you have a better idea where we're going and, and what the purpose is. Obviously, it's to love Jesus, have a relationship with him. Dana? When the New Jerusalem descends and you have the Messiah sitting on his throne and they're brought before him, this is in Enoch chapter 54. Revelation also details it in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Then in Revelation 21 through 3, we see Satan himself is bound. This is the dragon. He's bound for a thousand years. The next thing that's going to be happening is the nations are gathered to Zion. And that's in Isaiah 66, 18 through 23. Then once they're gathered, this is Matthew 25, 31, after the nations are drawn to the Messiah, who's sitting on his throne inside the descended New Jerusalem, it's Matthew 25, 31 through 46, he can do the sheep and the goats judgment. So that therefore the sheep are the only people that are mortal who live outside the New Jerusalem after the sheep and goats judgment. And they're going to be the ones repopulating the earth and beginning the millennial reign where there will be a thousand years of peace and they'll, they'll learn the law. Um, this is going to be uh, recorded in Revelation 20, verse 4 through 6, because it's detailing the royal priesthood, which is the resurrected saints who will rule and reign with Messiah during that thousand years. And as Isaiah 2, 2 through 5 explains, the law will go forth from Zion during the millennial reign so that there's peace on the earth. Let's look. Let me back that up just a hair. And one thing I don't really see here is, well, what happens to those who survive the tribulation? I think they will just be called into the air. So that might be your rapture type of event. But in my understanding, it's kind of a post-trib rapture where New Jerusalem's coming down. And even in my study Bible, which I thought was interesting because it kind of indicates a post-trib when I was looking at uh, Thessalonians the other day. It's actually my pastor preaching on the rapture. So my idea of the rapture is you're actually coming, he's gathering you from where you are. Because so there might be, I don't even like to say an exodus event anymore because people get too literal with it, and especially in the uh, messianic community. But it's, you are kind of be, you know, escaping these cities, I think, and you'll be kind of on the run and gathered in groups, surviving this tribulation. You won't be able to buy and sell. We know all these things. We've read Revelation. Um, and we'll be gathered we'll be gathered when new jerusalem's coming down we'll meet him in the clouds just like it's king and, and he's coming down he's gonna it's, it's coronation right he's coming down to rule and reign then he's got like this giant golden chariot and we're coming to the clouds to meet him not to go up with him it's like hey we're gonna meet you and go up it's like no he's gonna he's coming down so it's kind of a reversal of probably what i've been taught before in the past um and everyone's got their own idea um and then while new jerusalem zion is on the earth You'll have, it almost like reminds me of, because we're reading the Torah portion now, and we just got through uh, Joseph going to Egypt, and you know, um, his brothers coming down, um, and all the nations were coming to, to Egypt to because there was a famine, and everyone's starving. It's going it's to kind of be like, um, what if there's like a giant EMP, and everyone has lost technology, and, and we have to come for food. And I think it's going to be kind of, because we see like animals and wooden weapons, coming to this final battle it's like well maybe at that point 
um, after a thousand years, they've lost all the technology um, and so rely on just coming and paying tribute to New Jerusalem, making, making all the nations dependent on, on, on Yahweh. And that, that's an interesting thought. I like that. And it kind of makes sense. Um, because we, we see in Zechariah that you know they'll come for the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Obviously, this is all about the eighth day of Sukkot, which is the greatest feast in that celebration. That the eighth day is a picture of the never-ending Sabbath. So after the thousand years, which is the seven thousand years, you know we have the six years, six thousand years of just everything that's going on now. And I think we're at the end of that soon. And this thousand years of peace, we'll have a little battle with Satan. He'll come back. He'll be given a short time. And then the eighth day will begin. That's that never-ending Sabbath, where the whole earth will be renewed, and not just not just the safety of Zion. So it's a healing time for the earth. So that's where I'd say first we have the resurrection of the dead, the not just the dead, but those who died who were believers. You know, so you can be a believer in like Abraham was probably a believer in that he needed a savior. He didn't know his name was Jesus or Yeshua, or we don't even really know his name, right? So you can't say it's the name that matters. It's this concept. So he is saved by his faith in Yahweh and this Savior that would come to redeem them. Because it's all throughout, even Judaism, they have this idea of redemption of Israel. And they get so caught up in this physical redemption, which we're seeing here when New Jerusalem comes down and He's reigning as king. That's what they've been waiting for. Where's Messiah? Where's Mashiach? Uh, spiritual redemption took place first when Jesus came in his first coming. And then physical redemption later. So if you want to call that salvation or whatever, um, lots of different terms on there. I think we went into that. No, we haven't gotten into that yet. But that is something we might hit on the PowerPoint. Let's let him finish here. I don't know what he else has to say. we got like a minute He's left. On the earth. Let's look real quick at a different visual representation for that same timeline. The saints are resurrected at the beginning of the day the Messiah returns when the last trumpet sounds. The angels of heaven are sent to gather the resurrected saints, take them to the New Jerusalem to be protected from the wrath of the Lamb. This is when we meet Yeshua in the air at his coming. Yeshua and his angels descend to defeat the beast, the false prophet, and the armies of the ten kings. The angels then burn the land where the New Jerusalem will soon sit down, purifying it. The New Jerusalem descends after the land has been prepared at the beginning of the millennial reign. And that's something we'll get into in Zechariah, this idea of like purification. Well, we're already saved. Why do we need sacrifices? There's something as ceremonially clean, right? Ritual cleansedness, which was the, the temple system was all about. And this is kind of a, a picture of the temple, if you will. Like we said, there's in Revelation, see at the end, there is no temple per se, but this is still the house of the Lord, if you will. And it needs purity. So the burning of the land, Zechariah, we just read in the last few chapters, the land will be flattened to make way for this cornerstone, right? It talked about the, the, the you know the foundation stone. It's kind of a picture of the foundation stone, this connection between heaven and earth, um, connecting uh, you know, earth to God and, and heaven just like it was in Eden. It's all returning back to that. And that's the picture that's just makes sense. The city is the resource for the survivors of the day of the Lord. It helps them survive. The survivors of the nations are drawn to the city from everywhere under the firmament. Then Yeshua will conduct the sheep and goats judgment with the nations that are gathered to the city. The survivors who are shown mercy will begin to learn Torah. The law will go forth from Zion. And then the, the second resurrection would be those resurrected into life or those who are actually destroyed in hell, in the lake of fire, not in hell. Um, he had Sheol down there, which is just our idea of hell, but it's it's where I think everyone goes right now. I don't think anyone's going to heaven because that's not the goal, right? You're not supposed to be dwelling in heaven. He wouldn't even give you a picture of that. That's not the goal. The goal is return to Eden, right? Which at the end of the day, everyone has that concept. It's to return to Eden. It's how we get there that people get tripped up on, and that's okay. Because as long as we have the understanding that we should be reading God's Word and studying it and having 
faith and relationship with Jesus, trying to understand the narrative in a way that uh, helps you understand God's heart more will help you, especially with the trials to come. If you're waiting for a preacher rapture, the only problem with that is, is maybe you're not looking at how things are going to play out. Because once you start to question whether or not there's a preacher rapture, and you're like, well, I should probably be slightly aware of what is going to happen. Um, so I'm prepared in my heart. I'm physically prepared. I'm spiritually prepared. Um, that's why I made this shirt that says uh, Exile Strong, Exodus Ready. Not that I think I'm going to go journey to Israel on, on an Exodus. Like Unfortunately, like a lot of Messianics believe, it's that I need to survive this tribulation. I need to have this heart of Exodus where I'm getting out of Egypt spiritually, right? Egypt is the world, it's an idiom for the world, leaving that spiritually. All right, so let's read the vision of chapter 6, and then we'll, we'll just head on. Um, again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains. And the mountains were of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. And we talked about what the horses meant before and their colors, and we see them in Revelation again as well. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked to me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes towards the north country, the white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go toward the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Um, and before, we're seeing chariots now. We saw like these horses, kind of scouts before. The same word patrolling was used, but chariots kind of either, either give us the idea of maybe war or a king. You know, he would travel in a chariot to, to go out. And so maybe these four, again, we have the same number of four, four rulers, four kingdoms, something to look at like that. The crown and the temple. And the word of the Lord came to me, take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak. Zadak, um, possibly because this is the line of Zadok. I don't know if that's why his name is like that, but remember that was the high priestly line. We just had Hanukkah where the Maccabees were not of the line of Zadok, and we see what happened when they tried to maintain that priesthood. And also the kingship, which is interesting. We see a crown being put on, and this is something to keep in mind, on Joshua the high priest. So Yehoshua the high priest, sounds a lot like Yeshua, and probably maybe was Yeshua's actual name was more like Joshua instead of Jesus. But um, he probably wasn't actually crowned. We have to keep that in mind. Like This is a vision, so it's giving us a spiritual idea. There's definitely something happening um, in the context here. Like, yes, he is a picture of that Melchizedekian priest. He's a picture of, of God's connection to the earth. So he, in that way, he wears a crown. In that picture as high priest but he's not literally wearing a crown remember uh, Zachariah himself just as the new testament tells us we looked at the verse before i can't remember exactly what it was was he was killed between the altar um so his visions may have not been well received we don't know what exactly happened after all this and when he presented this scroll to people right? he gets a vision and then he has to relay the vision and they're like uh, maybe you're just crazy right <laughs> you think about it that way it's like People today, like, what if somebody came to you with, with this scroll they just wrote, like, this is from the Lord, I got these visions. They're like, yeah, yeah, all right, okay, man, all right. Let's keep reading here. And say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, the man whose name is the branch. So we see this a couple times before. For he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne and there shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, and Jedidiah and Hen the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. 
and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent you, and that shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord. So these guys coming out of exile, um, Persia, um, the north country, a lot of them did go to the north, um, but they were kind of scattered all about, right? And some just never returned. Uh, like I think we mentioned before, the story of Esther takes about 90 years later than this. <clears throat> and then even after that, Nehemiah and Ezra kind of are the picture of finally bringing security. So this, this, the whole Jerusalem remains without walls until that point, until Nehemiah comes and helps rebuild the gates and the walls, bringing physical redemption. And Ezra is a picture of bringing spiritual redemption. So it definitely took them some time, right? I kind of made the, the interesting point of like, let's say in 1948, Israel was kind of like what's happening here with Zechariah and Zerubbabel and, and uh, Joshua the high priest kind of coming back to the land and add 90 years later or whatever it is, it puts us around 2041. So it's like, dang, it took you that long to like, you know, it just puts it in context for us. Not saying that the end of the world is in 2041, just giving you an idea. Let's look at the study notes. Over here. Yeah, let's go here. So the last time we had the two women, and I said maybe they are pictures of the corruption of God's law, these false teachings that are taking this wickedness, this woman, putting it in her basket and taking her off to Shinar, which is where Babylon, the Tower of Babel, was built. Um, false teachings corrupting her, leading her away. It sounds good, you know, it's like the, the sweet whisper in your ear leading you astray. So I gave the suggestion that maybe they're Lady Liberty, Lady Justice. Um, again, it's not so much that these are pagan gods, in Ishtar and Ma'at Ma or whatever from Egyptian culture. Um, and they're seen not just in America, but all over the world, these pictures of these two. Um, the corruption of God's law, right? And then we kind of have a picture of the two mountains. I don't know if it talks about them here. In the beginning of, of 6, it says these two mountains of bronze. Um, yeah, it does mention them. Maybe a picture of Gerizim and Ebal, which are blessings and curses. You have blessings if you keep God's law, and curses if you don't. It's as simple as it is. It's not that he's cursing you. It's that he has set a perfect law for you to follow. If you're not following it, you're going to face curses. And the problem with that is... We can't keep all the law, and that's part of what exile is all about, is there's already a curse upon us because we're not in the land. This isn't the new Jerusalem. So the blessings that come with that and the temple system and the ceremonial cleanliness and being actually able to keep the feast because we can't keep any of, the single, any of the feasts at all in, in any form. So let's move on here. Four chariots. These are called the four spirits, the same term as the four winds and refers to the winds as messengers of Yahweh, and that is the function of these chariots, function these chariots are serving here. The horsemen in chapter 1 were comparable to the Persian courier service, but chariots were not used that way. It is unusual that a chariot should be used by a messenger because it would sh only slow him down and tire his horses unnecessarily. In the ancient Near East, a supernatural being in a chariot was usually transporting the deity rather than serving as a messenger. So I kind of like said a king, they're saying a deity. Yeah, it's something something different than we saw in chapter 1. Mountains of bronze. It's not entirely clear what the prophet is trying to convey with this image. Some believe it is a reference to a common Mesopotamian image of the sun god rising between two mountains, the morning light making rock appear bronze in color. Others see in the reference to bronze an allusion to fortifications, uh, bronze being used for gateways and other defensive works. Mountains were often seen as the home of God. And it's interesting, right? Because they had to always like go to a high mountain to worship under a green tree and all that, and then mountains were seen as temples, right? Um, it's a, another thing that was interesting, and I don't really have an answer. As you notice, I don't have many answers to anything. More questions. And that's kind of the, your, should be your goal. It's like, what questions can I stump myself with today while reading this? That is my goal every time. Uh, in Revelation and also Ezekiel, when they both see, I think they're both seeing the same structure. I think Ezekiel is more describing what's in the New Jerusalem. And I think we're getting kind of like a fuller 
size dimension of New Jerusalem from Revelation. But they both go, they're both taken to a high mountain, right? And I'm like thinking like, this thing is already huge. Like, on what high mountain are you, I mean, definitely I can be able to look down on it. Is the mountain heaven? Or where were they taken to, to see such a great structure? Uh, and from such a distance and given like binocular eyes, crazy. So I don't know what mountains those would be. I don't even know what the two mountains are here. I just think in context with what we've already talked about with the temple and the law, the perversion of the law. It kind of makes sense. Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, it could be um, Zion is a mountain, right? It sits on a mountain. Jerusalem now on a mountain. And there's the Mount of Olives. There's the two mountains. Could be pictures of them splitting. And we see this later in, I think, in the end of the chapter in the, uh, Zechariah 14. We see that continued on. Branch. It is not clear what this refers to in the Hebrew term used here. It's not the same Hebrew word term used in Isaiah 11. To refer to a coming ruler, scholars tend to argue two ways on the identity of the figure. I think it's Jesus. I think it's pretty clear. Given the earlier promise that Zerubbabel would be the one to complete the temple, obviously in context it's a picture of Zerubbabel. It's not, not everything is prophetic, okay? Like we said, it's, there's, a, there's a contextual image you need to have. There's a prophetic, maybe later, and there's also a spiritual thing you're supposed to take away. And maybe the prophetic is least important. Uh, and focus on contextual first, spiritually what you're supposed to get out of that. Because even just some people just go straight for the spiritual every time. Like you need to understand things in context before you try to get some sort of spiritual lesson lesson out of it. Because you can twist these things to say whatever you want to say. Unless you understand the context, not just of this chapter, but everything in a whole. Understand the heart of God. Given the earlier promise that Zerubbabel will be the one to complete the temple, the branch is Zerubbabel, and hence the prophet anticipates a coronation of the governor as a king over an independent Judah. This is a future ruler, a messianic figure, who will benefit from the faithfulness of Joshua and the temple priesthood. There is no indication that Jerusalem at this time period could have envisioned such a successful revolt against the Persian Empire since the city was unwalled and impoverished. In the broader ancient Near Eastern context, the term branch, or terms based on similar metaphors, have been attested as technical terminology referring to the rightful heir of an established dynastic line. Um, so yeah, out of a picture of him being king, and then this branch is a picture of Zerubbabel, because he's more of like a governor, right? Um, but uh, definitely a picture of this Melchizedekian king priest, right? combination of the two Joshua receiving a crown is a picture that one day a Joshua Yehoshua will take the crown and be our king and our priest right and he is now spiritually and then physically when he comes to redeem us physical redemption uh, we'll see that with New Jerusalem which is the rec recurring theme that's why I went over that timeline just to put it in a place for you um, it doesn't mean that it's where some people believe and if you read Revelation just straight up, because um, the timeline, it, it's definitely not chronological, those chapters. You're going to get the idea that it's obviously saying comes after the millennial reign. Um, I've started to see it differently, but I definitely understand that. If you read that, you're like, it seems pretty clear that it comes after the millennial reign. Um, John jumps around a little bit, and he kind of tells you what he's doing, too. He's like, okay, this is about this. And he goes ahead, gives you a little picture of the back, future, and then he kind of skips back again. And, and he does that throughout the book. So you can't be like, it's not just like a story. It's not a novel. And, and John does this. I mean, that's you read the Gospel of John. It's the same thing. He's That's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. Guess what? John's not part of the Synoptic Gospel because he's kind of following a spiritual idea. You know, with, with his Gospels, we just went through the whole book of John, so it makes sense. It's just... He's focusing on the feast and the Sabbath. That's always what he's talking about. It's like, and it was a feast of dedication, and it was Sukkot. And he's like giving you this like idea, like, oh, I have to clue into what's happening at Sukkot. What what are the things that go on in Sukkot? And and it gives you a picture of what Jesus was doing and what he was trying to portray. Not just like a novel of what happened, but really what he was trying to tie together. And that's what's amazing about John. And 
and his works. Last little note here, Josiah, son of Zephaniah, while many English translations, such as the NIV, render Josiah in this instance as Hen, as a personal name, there is good evidence to see this is a title for a temple steward. So the crown is being entrusted to several individu individuals, including Josiah the steward, son of Zephaniah. Yeah, so these guys are building them a crown, gold and silver. All right, hopefully that wasn't too crazy. I'm going to get up and start my day. Um, and don't get upset about the rapture stuff. It's I just want you guys to dig in. I want you to see something different. Um, uh, I'm always researching that. And if anything that makes you read the Bible more and prepare you is good. Uh, don't let it turn into arguments. Um, it just this is what makes sense to me now. And maybe it'll be different in the future. Um, and that's why we're reading these these books that aren't read enough, right? Because they they give us so much imagery of what God's plan was. And he's like, yes, we need this temple, but this temple is going to go away too. And ultimately, I want to get you back to the garden, right? That's the goal. I want to get you back to the garden. It's almost like he's, every time he should be just saying that, every chapter is like, this is going back to, this is about going back to the garden. This is going back to the garden. That's why so much agricultural themes just reoccur and why Jesus spoke in so many parables using agricultural themes and I like the idea that when he well, was raised from the dead that he was, uh, Mary thought he was a gardener because out there he was probably out there gardening he's like this is what I'm going to do when I come back and this is what you're all going to do when I come back that makes it a lot more real for me I don't know about you but that makes it a lot more real for me than He's already got spiritual beings in heaven that just worship him all the time. He wants us to worship him in a different way with our lives, right? So a lot of things we already do, I think it would be very similar to what we're doing in the letter right now. It's just going to be a very perfect world. We're in a fallen state. It's going to bring about this perfect monarchy, this perfect law that will go out to the whole world. And that's beautiful will be just in constant blessing. We won't have curses because we'll be keeping the law. And it'll be written on our hearts. We'll understand it. And then when you when you just understand something, you just do it. It makes sense. The reason we don't keep it is because we don't have understanding of the law. And that's why it's so important to study this so we can get more understanding. The more you understand God's heart, the more you'll make sense to you and you'll want to do it. Because first it's just straight up obedience. It's like dad told me to do this, I'm gonna do it, I don't really get it, I don't really want to do it. As you get older, you're like, oh, that's why dad would tell me to do that. It makes more sense. Now I want to do it, right? I wish I did it before. But now that uh, obedience and then, you know, faith comes after that sometimes. All right, shalom, guys. Take care.